Welcome to Three, a show about Federer, Nadal, and Djokovic. I'm Gil Gross, host of Monday Match Analysis with outstanding tennis journalist Joel Drucker and Amy Lundy. Our main topic today continues our trilogy of what we can learn, what recreational players can learn from the big three, and it's Rafael Nadal's turn. Uh, but we start with the debate that has really ravaged the tennis world. It has to do with the 2020 U.S. Open and with diminished fields due to COVID-19. Is there an asterisk next to this tournament? And uh, we'll start with you, Joel, as a, a lover of tennis history. And uh, yeah, where do, you, where do you land on this? Well, let's say five years from now, we're at a party. Remember, you used to have these things called parties and <laughs> we're hanging out with people and we're gathering and we're talking and we're looking back at the U.S. Open and we say, XX won the U.S. Open. And someone says, well, yeah, but the field was diminished. I said, and the field was diminished. And, you know, there weren't as many of the top women there. And there wasn't Federer and there wasn't Nadal on the men's side. And I think to myself, well, yeah, but I was being tested. These people were being tested every day for a disease for which there's no cure. They were living in a bubble. Uh, more than 150,000 people had died in America, people all over the world. To me, you win a major during a pandemic, you, can, you got it, you earned it. And whoever's not there, that's unfortunate. I mean, I'll, I'll miss, there are a lot of women's players I'm gonna miss not seeing, but I think whoever wins it has the right to earn it after going this long without competition. I mean, at most, any woman who wins it is gonna have played two tournaments prior since March. Uh, men is gonna have played one in the Cincinnati, New York. I think that is a well-earned win, and that's a different set of circumstances than some of the other shallow fields over the year that are a result of political tennis machinations and things like that. Okay, so no asterisk for Joel. I'm pretty sure even if Amy agrees, she's going to answer this question really much differently. Am I right? <laughs> that's part of the show. Exactly. Uh, it's a special year. It is a different year. Um, I think people at that party that Joel's talking about will say, oh, that was the COVID year. You know, that was the year that everything was crazy. We were in the middle of this pandemic and this um, sharply divided political atmosphere because of the election and just, um, but I looked at it statistically. Um, and I, I think the interesting thing is, I just looked at the men, by the way, because this is the big three that we like to talk about on this podcast, and um, that doesn't involve the women. And I do perceive that the women's field is more weakened. But the men's field, is it that much weaker than it has been in years past? Well, there's a few different ways that you could look at it. First of all, there's a website called Ultimate Tennis Stats. And they say that the average of qualified players that are in any U.S. Open field is 90%. That's pretty good. 90% of, of people who qualify enter the field. What does that mean? What does that mean? I mean of, of the eligible, like, so that means 90% of the top 110 players? Okay, good. Exactly. Right. Exactly. So this year, um, as of today, it's only 87%. That's not that far off from 90%, right? When was the low mark? Again, according to Ultimate Tennis Stats, the low mark was in 2017 with only 80% of eligible how far, back do they, how far back do they do their research? I, I don't know. And, you know, I can't vouch because these aren't my numbers. But I, I, it was just an interesting stat that I saw today in my research. Now, these are my numbers, which I'm about to tell you. Um, I just wanted to look at the seated, the top um, players that are going to be seated if they were seated today uh, versus 2019. And there, there's two different ways that you can kind of look at rankings. I wanted to look at their rankings. And you could look at the median, right, which is the one in the middle, the ranking in the middle, and you can look at the average or the mean. So in 2020 the median ranking of the top 32 players as it stands today is 21.5 the average ranking is 20.6 so around 21 right so last year what was it the median was 17.5 
and the average was 17.4, so around 17. So what does that mean? It's lower, right? So you're looking at 21 versus 17. Well, but let's think about this. If you are a player in the the field, say you're, I don't know, Dominic Team or Stan Vavrenka, you have the prospect of playing among seated players in any round, a player who is an average with a ranking of 21 or a player who has an average ranking of 17. Is the 20th ranked player in the world that different than the 17th play ranked player in the world? No. So again, with this sort of set of metrics, the field is not that much different than it is in any given year. But you're applying this to the men. You see, and look, the woman, the men, yeah, we see that and looks pretty close. I mean, I think the key thing is two, two notables at the top who aren't there. And that's right. Life. And that's what made the difference. Last year, the two that weren't there in the top 32 were Kevin Anderson and Milos Raonic. Lower this rank. year, you know, it's, it's Roger, Rafa, and a couple of others. So. But it's then, kind of interesting. But the woman, ahead, the woman there's way many of the top 10 not there. This is by far the weakest U.S. Open women's field ever since the U.S. Open started in 1968. But I don't know. I just, again, I just think you win it. You win it during a pandemic. You got it. It's okay. And I think, I think this is sort of like beyond asterisks, asterisks. And I don't even know. I mean, yeah, I just think of it that way. I think I, I'm closer to where Amy's at. And one of my, the well, first thing. What's that? What's that? I mean, there's no, there, we're all, so, we're all no, no. Does it matter, Joel? <laughs> no, I'm saying I, I, I look at it more uh, as, you know, from a strength of field um, perspective. Less so, uh, okay. And I agree with you, everyone, anyone who um, basically overcomes all the challenges that comes with, with winning this tournament deserves major props. But when it comes to, I feel like what we're talking about is when you look at the list of U.S. Open title winners, is there going to be an asterisk mentally next to the 2020 winner? Well, no. And, and, yeah, you say yes. No, no, I say no still. But I also think we got to watch the tournament play out. And if there is going to be an asterisk, I think we're going to feel it. I think we're going to see it. Um, I I'm think not sure that's what you something mean by that. that. Uh, okay, so... Anyone who's watching the NBA right now, the NBA has been great. The intensity, awesome. the intensity is at an all-time high. The games are tremendous. They're close. They're hard fought. It, it feels like a regular playoff basketball game. There's not going to be an asterisk because we feel that this is authentic, that this is great competition. If I were to bet when, when it's time to watch Cincinnati in the U.S. Open, I think it's going to feel like world-class, top-of-the-line, incredible tennis – with uh, the emotions, you know, ramped up. And I think, I think it's, it's going to feel like there shouldn't be an asterisk. But I do think we should leave, um, leave a little bit to kind of observe and just try to feel this out. Well, wait, so you're, wait a second. So you're saying that if the quality of play is sloppy because they're play, they haven't played an individual sport in months and they're, and they're making unforced errors and they're, you know, they're, they're, it, their, their shooting percentage in tennis terms isn't as high as usual. Therefore, oh, yeah, she, she won the U.S. Open in the year people were double faulting because of COVID. Phil, what if it feels like a challenger's event? Like, what if it what just do doesn't mean, what do you have mean it? It feels like, Gil, you've played. But what, what do you mean feels like? It's the U.S. Open. I mean, the, the, but the, there's no yeah. crowd. There's not going to be a crowd. And okay. I'm not, I, believe me, the whole thing I just spewed out is that it, there really shouldn't be an asterisk. But here's the question, guys. The French Open that Federer won, where mm -hmm. he didn't have to play Nadal and he didn't beat Nadal, is there an asterisk? Absolutely not. I will show you 25 examples of draw-aided slam triumphs. And we could probably, we spend a little time on this, find another 20 in basketball, football, baseball, teams that didn't win their NLCS, teams that didn't win their NBA. You win who's in front of you. It's not, an, it's not an asterisk to Federer. I mean, it's, it would have been nice, of course. It would have been poetically nice for him to have beaten Nadal and then get a French. That's fine. Well, he didn't. He, had, that he beat the guy who beat Nadal. That's kind of intriguing. I mean, if, anyone, if anyone's got to scratch his head around these French things, it's, it's Robin Soderling who got to the finals two years in a row there. 
and, and you know, loses to Feder and Nadal and whatever. But I don't, no one is going to put that there. And again, then I think you have your answer right there. Right. And I totally agree with that, Joel, because no one, you know, Nadal, look at Nadal's 2017 path. He played two seeds, uh, Juan Martin Del Potro, the uh, 24 seed, and Kevin Anderson, the 28 seed in the final. Feder had a, had, until he met Chilich, six seed in the final, the Australian Open the following year. He didn't play any top 10 players. No one says Nadal has 19 major titles wow. or, or eight, 18 plus 2017 U.S. Open. Nobody does that. So I agree with you. There is a 95% chance in my mind that um, at the end of the 2020 U.S. Open, no one is going to really be trying to uh, put an asterisk on it unless they're – obviously bias towards um, how the numbers shake up at the end. Also, this is such a unusual, I mean, for example, I don't even call it an asterisk. Like I look at, I look at some Australian open winners from the way back in the seventies and eighties. And I just, I'm aware of those being in shallow fields. So I don't think a lot of, uh, of Chris O'Neill winning the 1978 Australian open as a, as a tremendous feat. I mean, and, and, uh, but that's it, that, but now, in this era, and particularly amid what's going on in the world right now, I mean, it's okay. It's all right. So. Agree. Yeah. We all agree, I think, just in, just in different ways. And just to- well, it's neat. It's yeah. neat. I think it's fun how we came yeah. to it. I, mean, I, enjoyed, I yeah. enjoyed hearing that. Um, yeah. Per usual, Amy, you found some good data. I yeah, like that's that. good. And I think the, the point is salient because there's a very good chance that whoever, at least on the men's side, it's very likely that whoever ends up winning it will have a tougher path than plenty major champions. And we don't question their, their titles at all. Just to get introspective for a second before we get to Nadal, I really haven't seen many members of, of the media in tennis argue that there should be an asterisk. Have you seen that? No, no, I haven't. And I don't think anyone, I, I don't think they could dare. I think it's just, it's just kind of like, it's like a floating notion because of the field and because of things. And also because I think uh, sometimes people run out of things to say, so they have to kind of evaluate an outcome rather than do what we do, where we're going to talk about the process of how these people play and go about their business of tennis. And it's, I think it's going to be interesting to see how they play and how the fitness holds up. I mean, I have an article that just came out uh, uh, this recently called I was my working title was the the year of playing dangerously and how that's and how players are going to be affected and and it's you know you, we're not going to control the weather in New York and it's going to be someone's going to play two straight four set five set matches and see how the fitness goes and the bodies hold up that's that's the real question is how these bodies are going to hold up so last week we we talked about Roger Federer and what recreational players can learn uh, from the Swiss maestro and Amy, you seem to kind of what what you go by in life is what would Roger Federer do? And and well, then you, not in life, not in life. Sorry, in, in tennis, in tennis, Just, in tennis. No, I I was really talking about it from a a fitness and conditioning standpoint, right? Just because of his longevity. But but still, you're someone who have has Federer molded your game more than the other two. Oh God! <laughs> on the spot. Uh, you know, all three have had a huge impact on the way I play to this day. Just thinking about, you know, what would Novak do in this instance, or Rafa comes into my head all the time. And you know, three, four years ago, if you'd asked me, like, who is your favorite of the big three, or who do you see yourself the most like? I wouldn't have said Rafa, but I depend on that guy, you know, in tough spots. And, and I think about his work ethic and his mentality. So work ethic, mentality, grit, uh, that's, that's definitely, those are things that Nadal really exudes. Is that kind of what you take away from, from Rafa at large, Joel? Well, it also helps that I'm left-handed and even though, I wasn't taught to the foreign like that. So there's some fun visual things. Yeah, I agree with that about the the devotion, the tenacity, the positive qualities, the the problem solving. Um, I think that's what people can really learn from Nadal. I think most of all, his his body language and energy. I mean, the way like he plays like, uh, you know, he, he plays like this 
energy he brings to every point and every match. And, and it's for him and it's for the fans and it's for his opponents. There's this respect he brings to the game that's so profound. And I think people can learn that. I think people, it's so funny. People talk about, oh, what can I learn from the pros? And they talk about strokes like Nadal's forehand and his top spin or Federer's great forehand and serve and Novak's backhand. But it really has to do with how these guys, the attitude they bring to the game. And Nadal, of course, brings that over the top intensity. And you know how he brings that to his practice. It's like, I think I, I forget if I said this before, but Jimmy Connor is kind of an ancestor of Nadal. Said to once, if you play every match like it's the big match, when the big match comes, you're ready. So he's, there's this way that Nadal yeah. is kind of like strong work habits, you yeah. know, good practice in, good practice out. And so he brings that engagement to how he plays all the time. And I think that's what people can learn. And so maybe what you do, you think, wow, how do I do that for 20 minutes well instead of 45 minutes sloppy? Yeah, if you try harder than your opponent, you're, you're in a good spot. And even if you lose, you can feel good about yourself. Well, Gil, right. you're the one who most plays like Nadal of the three of us. Yeah. Because you have a career. What, is good, what, is, what do you, you learn or what do you think people can learn from Nadal? So uh, I, my coach would be the first one to say, I mean, he studied Spanish tennis with Sergi Bruguera and Pato Alvarez. You know, those were his mentors. So that, that Spanish system of play is what was instilled into me. And the essence of it is uh, first and foremost, what, what kind of, I think this ties into what we just talked about. You have to be willing to suffer. You have to be willing to play the extra ball and you might be out of breath and you might be feeling it in the legs, but guess what? If they miss first, you won the point. And that comes to kind of another big principle. You don't have to win the point. If you don't lose, sometimes that's good enough. So consistency, um, willingness to suffer. You need great fitness to put those things into play. And then on the technical side, I'd say heavy emphasis on footwork, racket speed, build around the forehand. Um, and, and those are the real um, foundations of the classical Spanish game, which Nadal has just mastered. Amy, you talk to a lot of coaches. What do you make of the whole, I want to hear some of your thoughts about this Spanish approach. And then, I have, and then I have some thoughts about, um, about Nadal and what makes him maybe a little different too. Um, you know, I think the Spanish approach, um, whether it's a fair characterization or not, is associated with grind tennis and identification of offense, defense, neutral on, you know, any given ball. Um, fast identification of that and I think there's a movement that is antithetical to that right now that is like look if you look at the data there's not the the rallies are not long so why would grind tennis be a good thing why would the Spanish method be a good thing but on the flip side you could say well if I am the one with the longer rally and I have the abilities to sustain a quality longer rally. Won't I always outlast the other person in the point? So it's, it's really interesting, you know, how the, the data trends are being interpreted right now and how Spanish tennis is kind of getting a bad rap. But um, it's really hard to argue with Nadal's success, especially on clay. And, um, you know, for me personally, I'm somebody that struggles with focus and attention. Um, I'm, I'm ADD without the hyperactivity. I've actually been diagnosed with that. So focus is really, really hard for me. And Nadal wrote in his book that every single point is a battle for focus. It's like a dog fight. So sometimes when, when I'm playing, I'll just repeat Rafa, 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 over and over and over again to remind myself of his focus. I want to talk about something about this uh, rally thing. And I know we know at the pro level, we're seeing that a great many points are won at the zero to four rate ratio. And that's true at the recreational level. But my point about this, and I pointed this out to our buddy, Craig O'Shaughnessy, the pros rally that short because they have to, because they can hurt each other sooner. And so if I don't hit you, someone's going to hit me. That's pro tennis. At the recreational level, they last that short because they can't. 
And I think the Spanish thing has a certain merit at the rec recreational level, because if they can keep the ball and play longer, there's a good chance the other person's going to miss because I think recreational players have a harder time keeping the ball in play three or four times. So that's where the Spanish thing is worthwhile. I think that what I love about Nadal, and this I think vastly separates him from all the other Spanish players, including such great ones as Moya and Ferreira, is the way he dimensionalized his game. He embraced what I call his inner John McEnroe, the sliced backhands, learning to come to net, improving his serve, all the other things that are kind of a little bit more from my era when I learned to play. You know, you see that. What, he's, a, he's not a great volleyer in the Stan Smith 1970s or Tim Henman way where he sticks the volley deep. But boy, he, most of his volleys bounce before the service line. But boy, does he take care of them. And he comes in on this approach shot, and he's got a great overhead. So you see how he's kind of gone beyond what the stereotype of, of the Spanish game is. And he did that fairly fairly early but you know obviously from the play roots and the focus so it's I, I think it's very impressive how he even though he's a top five player was improving these parts of his game his development I, I couldn't agree with you more his development compared to to Federer and Djokovic is the most stark of the three I feel like he is you know the, the slice backhand you mentioned you go back you can go back to 2011 and watch Nadal slice his backhand and it's a floater. It's not, it's not a great slice. And now, now he's really able to control it and, and knife it. The volleys are, are tremendous. He, you know, he is, he's so much more than that stereotypical dirt ball grinder, but can I go back real quick? Sorry to the to four shots or less thing. What drives me crazy about that narrative is we say, okay, most points are zero to four shots therefore firepower is what matters and consistency doesn't. But if you miss on the second ball, that is consistency. That's a measure of lacking in consistency. Right. So that's what I don't like. I, th I don't like that immediately. It's zero to four. Therefore, big serve, big forehand, go to the net, finish the point. No, zero to four can mean consistency, that you are less likely to miss those first two balls. Well, the pros, because they can't. That's my point. See, the pros – or that short because they can and they have to. They have to do that because they have to fire fast because someone else can fire them. But I think way down the chain, and I mean past the top 300, you know, anyone outside of the top 300 of the world, I think if you thought conceived points as six, zero to six, zero to eight, I, I agree with you. And I think as a development tool, I think it's much more important to learn to do things like keep the ball in play. And that's true if you come to net. The purpose of coming to net isn't hit volley winners. It's to force passing shot errors. That's the real thing and apply that pressure. But Joel, there are you, you and I have this debate like so often, and I'm not sure I disagree with you. I just don't think you have the stats to back that up. Back I mean, that, that the, this zero to four concept is different slightly at the pro level than it is down well, the food that's chain. Right, significantly. Because I think down the chain, most people can't keep the ball and play more than three well, times. Well, the, the key thing that you said there is, I think, there's also the school of thought that what's happening at the pro level is the same that's happening at the junior level, same that's happening at the college level, same that's happening at the amateur level. It's just scaled down, scaled way down. I mean, I, I personally am a 3-5 three, three, player. I have seen players who can come onto the court and overpower um, and, and finish me off, you know, in two shots with a big serve and a big forehand. But more often, I do see the player with the higher shot tolerance that is going to win. Um, and I think it's the same at the pro level. I really do. I mean, I, I really don't see much of a difference. You know, it's funny. Dick Braden has done did research for years that showed how how hard it was, how very few recreational rallies went longer than like four shots. That was, that was a big thing. Right. And it's the same at the pro level. No, but, but the point is, but the point is the pros, the pros, this happens to the pros, they, they don't make as many errors. They don't make as many errors as the recreational. Do we know that for 100%? We don't know that for 100%. Okay. I know, but I just think I, it's interesting. And and there is a guy, um, Warren Pretorius. Yes, I know Warren. His com Dartfish. company is what is that's, is that's Dartfish. Isn't that Dartfish? 
Warren? No, I know Warren. no. Dartfish is the software company that a lot of the coaches use. Oh, but okay. anyway, Warren does a lot of research for USTA. Great guy. And um, they're, they're actually, right now, they're studying uh, amateur players. Well, and they're gathering fabulous. data on us well, just okay, to learn well, more we'll about us. That. That we study that. I guess I would say from, from being around it for decades and watching a lot of, of recreational tennis and playing it and seeing it. And, and I don't mean juniors who are going on the fast track. I mean three fives and four O's and four fives and all that. But you're right. There isn't the scientific data there is. But I think, I think recreational players who try to practice zero to four sometimes are, are ill-advised. They're going to they're gonna, they're gonna lose to people like Gil or me, or when you're playing, you're winning your matches, Amy, you're playing consistently. Uh, I, I just, I just see that. I mean, you're right. I don't have a hundred percent data for that. Well, we all know there's a fi fine line between pushing and, you know, firing the ball, you know, committing to your shot. There's that fine line between offense and defense. That's what makes tennis such a great sport. Absolutely. Um, but, but go ahead, Gil. Doesn't that kind of support Joel? So let's say, let's say we go to a USTA 10 and under tournament. There'll be some kids who are going to moonball it and they might win the tournament. But once they get to a certain level, once the tennis reaches a certain level, you can't moonball anymore because the players are too good. Doesn't that kind of support what Joel no, is but trying my, to get at? Those kids, those kids are just playing for outcomes. I'm talking about the process. And I think the key in development is learning how to hit shots that you can own and you can, and you can possess. And the way, the, say, the way tennis has evolved in the last 30 years is that the lock and load baseline way of being steady for, that started with, let's say, Borg and Chris Everett became a prevailing model uh, of steadiness and consistency. And that can still work. That can still work. Who's, how many players on tour are more consistent? And let's rewind to 2012, okay? Uh, Nadal, Djokovic, Murray. How many players on tour made more balls in the court than, than those three? Well, that's, that's right. Well, that's true. But look, everyone in the top 200 is at least the NCAA champion. So we're talking about a skill level that's pretty good. Those right, but really I'm just saying the, the, the thought that consistency is kind of king, which is I think the school of thought that Nadal came from, and, and there's much more to it than that. But I still think that is at, at his roots, consistency is king. I, I believe that that is true at the highest level. I don't think that ever really goes away. Well, if Agassi taught us anything, it's that. Look at the, look at the evolution of Andre Agassi from going this kind of electric shot maker. And then by the end of his career, he, be, he was playing more like a Spanish player. I think the new research that has emerged, and, and this goes along with what Nadal does so well, is within those first four shots, aside from just that ironclad, I'm going to outlast you, that four shot, you know, consistency, what the research is bearing out is if you take a forehand after your serve, um, you're going to statistically win the point more than the other guy. So um, the players who do that really well, including Nadal, um, are going to win, you know, matches. I'd agree with that. And it's right. I think you're right. The zero to four, what you see at the pro level, is this taking command of the court and the position. And the problem with that, though, at the recreational level, is that people have enough artillery. Like, you know, you see Nadal. I mean, has anyone ever shown you how well to run around a backhand? I mean, he's hitting forehands from the right alley sometimes and then running and covering the court. And so this gets into the fitness and the movement. So I think it's a lot of it is a question for recreational players of how they want to scale their game properly. I have a big problem when I go to teaching conferences and I hear teaching pros telling adult recreational players to play points like that. Adult recreational players who look, if you run or if you're in the business of running around backhands, you better do something that for and you better be ready to cover it. And so, so it's, it's just an interesting way of how you should really see the game. I, I have a big problem with teaching pros who try to teach adults as if they were juniors, as if they were aspirational juniors. An aspirational junior, I get it. I get it. And that's a neat thing to learn from Nadal. I think there are a lot of other things to learn from Nadal, no matter what your, no matter what your age or skill level. Like you talked earlier, Amy, about that focus. I think that's fantastic. But don't try to learn the runaround. <laughs> Well, you can, you can, but you better then lay in the, the, the sprint, Pete. You better then say, okay, then uh, 
three times a week, I'm going to go to a local track and I'm going to run some sprints. You know, I'm going to put in the homework that's going to allow me to do this. Well, actually, my coach is making me run now, which is like <laughs> in the evening after I put tennis away for the day. Oh, God. What are you doing, sprints? Um, I'm going to start incorporating sprints. I mean, I guess I was in such bad condition that right now I'm just running like miles for endurance. Oh, that's the cardio. Yeah. And you know, you know, um, to, to bring up a quick anecdote about Nadal, I don't know if it was in his book or if I read it in an article somewhere that he'll get on the treadmill and he'll watch a match while he's on the treadmill and he will run, 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 run while the ball is in play while it's live. And then he'll walk, walk, walk for the entire match. And that's his treadmill workout. Well, I kind of, based on that, I kind of had it in my head that I really didn't need to do any outside running, but I've been told otherwise. And, and I do believe that I've seen Roger go on distance runs before. I know that he'll go for a, you know, five mile run as part of his regime, so I guess endurance is part of this too. It's a huge part of it. It's a huge part of shot tolerance. The, the more tired you get, the more likely it is that you're going to miss the next ball. I also just want to be clear. I don't think that the big first forehand is at all at odds with the Spanish way or, or Nadal's way. Because remember, the, the drills, footwork and racket speed, that's the foundation but so when you're, when you're being, when you're playing consistently, the idea is that you're swinging as hard as you possibly can, but you're still consistent. And that's really important because that's why it's not pushing. That whole thing about the forehand is so much, very much in the Spanish thing. And I think it has to do, like you said, Gil, as hard as you can to control it. So then we get to the parallel work, which is the skill building. So are people taking lessons? Are they working? Are they drilling? Are they doing certain game things? Or are they just playing practice sets? If you're just playing practice sets and competitive matches, it's pretty hard to actually build an arsenal. And so then people overhit. And so they think, oh, I got to hit it like this guy. But they don't really have a skill. So that's really kind of the, that's kind of the challenge of the learning from these guys. That's true with learning from all three of them. I saw Nadal training at his academy last week on an Instagram video. Hand feed. Hand feed. Sure. That is, that's key. And by the way, it shows that you're never too good for hand feed. I think that's where you develop your, your racket speed um, to, to the fullest extent because the ball has literally no pace. You have to generate everything. And I, I believe growing up like that is why your big forehands, Verdasco, uh, Nadal. Now, it's not like all the biggest forehands are Spanish, but I just think that that's kind of part of it. I agree with you. Well, um, hand, 95% of the balls I hit in my lessons are hand feeds. What, what's been your experience with some of these things, Amy? Um, I'm not a big fan of hand feeding. I'm your typical American, you know, bull crap, um, big serve, big forehand, or that's my goal anyway. That's what I want. Um, but it, it just, um, and, and I'm, I'm, uh, kind of poking fun at that style of play because it, I think it just shows that so much can be learned from Nadal, um, you know, the, even his backhand, I mean, it's kind of the un, unsung part of his game. It's just consistent as hell. I mean, that thing does not miss. Um, you do see a ton of winners and you do see a ton of run around, but um, even the backhand. Underrated. Well, that he's really hitting underrated. with the right hand. He's a natural righty. So yeah. he's using it a little bit like a forehand. Is it surprising that nobody's tried to kind of, emulate the Nadal forehand like on the pro tour because nobody he's been the king of RPM for over a decade no one hits it with more spin than him and he has the follow through over the same shoulder I, I raised my right hand of course I should have raised my left but you know is it kind of, it's always been interesting to me no one has really come out there and you haven't seen a forehand that's looked like oh well they're just trying to do the Nadal yeah, it's kind of well, its own it's its own kind of stroke. It's not it's sort of technically inefficient. I mean, I think the Verdasco stroke is a more technically mimicable one. But yeah, it's pretty uh it's pretty much his and his alone and boy, all that all that speed on the ball and the RPM is just amazing. I think at one point, I don't know if this is still the case, Jack Sock was actually attaining more RPMs on his forehand. That <laughs> two is a um 
technically different kind of stroke. I mean, how he, he loads that thing up and contorts his, his arm and all that to get the, uh, and the severe grip to get Maybe the RPMs. the racket. <laughs> well, I mean, you, you would not encourage any junior to do that, right? Yeah, and the, and the resultant injuries. And of course, on the Lex line, what's a Jack Sox string his racket at like 32 or something incredibly low, and wow. he just is throwing himself at that ball. It's a little bit of a mortgaging his future. Let's, let's end here. Nadal's greatest weapon, because I bet we might have different answers. Amy, what's, what's his best weapon, biggest weapon? Um, can, I, can I say an intangible, his tenacity? Absolutely. Tenacity. Okay. Joel? Oh, Amy, Amy got me. Yeah, his heart. His heart. That's kind of related to tenacity. Like Billie Jean, my favorite Billie Jean King quote, persistence is a talent. And this guy just is a, a, the ultimate pit bull. Who would, you, who would you want playing for the fate of the planet more than Rafael Nadal? <laughs> okay, yeah, I can't, I can't disagree. Never mind, I was wrong. We all agree. Okay, technical? Forehand. Forehand? Oh, um, well, I did a whole piece on just how great and dominant his second serve is, so I'm going to have to go with that. Okay, there we go. Now we're different. I'll say footwork. Amazing footwork, Rafa Nadal. Excellent. All right, that'll do it for this episode of three. Again, uh, we'll be doing the same thing with Novak Djokovic. What can recreational players learn from him? I don't know if it'll be next week or if it'll be down the road, but we'll get there eventually. Cincinnati next week. Very exciting. And uh, we'll have you covered with the biggest storylines here on three. Subscribe on iTunes. Subscribe on YouTube. Like the video. Rate and review. And we'll see you next time on the next episode. Three.